selamat petang. Uh, my Malay is not very good. Uh, tak bagus. That's why you have to allow me to give my presentation in English. So I'm the uh, currently I am the vice dean in the Yong Lulin School of Medicine. My main portfolio is research, and this is very uh, pertinent in terms of uh, what we call the academic health system. So I think, uh, obviously, I think uh, we are here to share experiences and learn from each other. So I thought for this particular uh, sharing sessions, I'd like to actually uh, bring all of you in a journey historically uh, from the last 10 years to the present time, what has actually evolved in the National University Health System. So I think uh, just give you a bit of a history on uh, N, uh, the Singapore's uh, health system. Way back, more than 10 years ago, the government at the time, the Minister of Health, thought that it was easier for Ministry of Health to be shielded from the daily tasks, chores of uh, looking after the health system. So what they decided to do at the time was they created two systems so that these two systems could manage the entire health system in the island of Singapore. On the east side is called the Sing House. On the west side was the National uh, Health Group. And the idea is these two clusters, so-called, would be trying to compete in some ways. Single system, they thought it was not competitive, su sufficiently competitive. So they created two systems, and so the minist Ministry of Health basically is shielded from what's happening uh, every day. So in, uh, in those days, the main mission for the Ministry of Health was to look after patients. Obviously, that's still the mission. And, uh, and they have this motto to say that the, the health care should be better, faster, safer, and cheaper. I think that applies to Indonesia, probably. So that was well and good more than 10 years ago. So people understood what the Ministry of Health wanted. But at that time, I think uh, at the same time, Singapore was go also going through a lot of uh, what we call challenges in terms of uh, economic development. So I think the, the, uh, the Prime Minister was uh, uh, advised that in order for Singapore to be, continuous, to be continuously competitive, it had to invest in research and innovation. So I think the, the, uh, at that time, I think the government accepted the recommendation to actually uh, uh, invest in research as an engine of growth, future economic growth. So they started a program of uh, trying to build research uh, intensively uh, in many sectors in Singapore, so including so-called biomedical research and development, which they thought was a very important way to redevelop the economy. So they started building all these institutes uh, to try to jumpstart the research and development landscape in Singapore because without all this, they thought it was too slow to let it evolve naturally. So they did something, they designed this so that it would become faster. So that was about 15 years ago. So there was a timeline to achieve some of these things. So along the way, so I think, uh, sorry, there's a uh, typo here, 2005, okay? So along the way, I think uh, they actually was very successful because that was the easy part. The phase one was the easy part because all you have to do is to build laboratories. But the second phase, which was five years later, was more challenging because then they have to actually start to do the translation. So they knew that it was challenging because uh, building laboratories, building buildings are easy. But getting people to deliver the impact is challenging. So at that time, they thought eventually they have to translate, meaning that you got to actually uh, change, make the discoveries relevant to the healthcare system and also to the economy. So I think they started going into the second phase from 2005, 6 
uh, to the next uh, five years, so-called biomedical uh, phase two. So that was uh, done, but they realized that it was challenging. So because of that reason, eventually, I think uh, the Ministry of Health accepted the mandate that they have to rely upon doctors to do translation. That was why the new Minister of Health at the time in 2008 declared that uh, now from now on, they have to revise the policy and obtain the cabinet's approval to include clinical research as part and parcel of Ministry of Health's mandate. Because they realized that in the past, research was never a priority. And then uh, at that time, they felt that it's easier. Just let the Americans do the research. And we just basically send our doctors there to learn and then copy and that's it, save money. But they realized that that's not the right thing because you got to actually do the translation. If you start off with uh, discoveries, you have to actually bring discoveries to the base site. So that was the mandate given now. Because of that reasons, they thought, again, easier to just build health system. So I think uh, then, that was the time when NUHS was actually established. So they actually approached the hospital, they approached the university, and then asked them to form a health, uh, a, a health system. So then, from that on, it was 2008, the hospitals, and then they, they, they established two national centers, and then they bring three schools together, School of Medicine, Dentistry, as well as Public Health together to form the university, uh, 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 National University Health System. So it's very easy to remember three plus three plus three. There are three pillars they asked us to do, clinical research and patient care. So that was, well, well on paper it's very easy. So that was what we are supposed to do, okay? So I think, uh, but obviously, this is minister. They tell you what to do, but you got to do it. So doing is not so easy. So then the mandate given, then we stretch our head to see what, uh, how do we actually start it off. So that was where I think uh, we knew the challenges, but I just summarized a study I did at the time, because I was at the time the head of medicine. So I did a quick study about what's happening. So I think this is a questionnaire. Uh, the sample size, the subjects uh, comprise people who are both in the hospital as well as the university. Recognizing that uh, in many places in Asia, we, we evolve separately. The university of one arm and the hospital, they actually evolve separately and different a parallel track. So we did a studies both the university and the hospital. Just very quickly summarizing the results. So if you ask the so-called people from the university, what is their most important disincentive if they want to become academic? Obviously, it's pressure. We know this. It's pressure when they have to serve, do clinical service, teaching, and research. And the second thing is, uh, uh, what is actually the major obstacle for them to become a university so-called clinician scientist? Again, it's actually not enough protected time because I think clinical service is very busy. Then uh, I think the worst, obviously, all these things, all the competing priorities, which is very difficult to manage. But I think more importantly is actually this important factor. So if you say that university doctors are having under a lot of pressure, what about the hospital doctors? So I think this is something that is not appreciated. If you ask the ho doctors in the hospital side, what is actually, uh, whether they are actually in, in uh, greater pressure or which, which people are in greater pressure. Invariably, the doctors, the doctors in the hospital think that they, they think the university doctors are not busy. They strongly disagree. So that's where I think the, the challenge is, is actually people perceive the other side as less busy versus the other. So this kind of cultural issues remain a challenge if you want to combine the hospital with the university, which you have to sort out. So I think recognizing this, this is where I would say this is a major uh, uh, issue we have to sort out. So I think the, the, the currently, most of the hospitals as well as universities are arranged in terms of departments. Same in, in Indonesia. So I think on one hand, you've got a hospital CEO, which reports to the Ministry of Health. So the CEO pays your salary, so you've got to follow their, 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 their instructions. 
But so they are, they are actually supposed to deliver good quality care as well as keep the cost down. On the other hand, you got the university coming in and uh, which uh, asks you to do teaching and research. And they're supposed to actually, and these people reports to the dean and to ministry of, to min ministry of education. And they're supposed to actually uh, do academia. So that's where, when you have tension, in, uh, in business term, it's called matrix disorganization. So the whole thing shatter. So I think in order to manage this sort of disorganization, you've got to actually organize it again. So this is where we have we started trying to do it. Sorry, I just have to get my the laser is not. Okay. So I think the that's where the greatest challenge is not actually developing the different parts. When you want to form a academic health system, it's actually trying to bring all the different parts together. Sure, it happens to, to, to Indonesia as well. So that's a major uh, issue. So that's why I think uh, we have to understand this first and then try to fix the challenges. So what did we de do at the time? Realizing that the entire matrix is actually disorganized. That's why when the minister say, okay, this form of academic health system is not that easy. So you've got to actually fix the issues. So we did three things at that time. The first thing we did is, we unify the governance system. That's very key because now you've got the different leaders. The hospital has its own leadership, the university has its leadership, and then the administrators and so forth. So we have to unify them all. So I think that's where what we did at the time, uh, way back in 2008. <coughs> Can we advance this? Okay. So I think we, we, we did this, this uh, very complicated matrix. The hospital, the university here, the, the, the Ministry of Health here. So each of these uh, bosses contract. They form a new governing board with all this percent of reporting. Okay? So the main, ultimately the owner is still Ministry of Health, but there's some ownership here. So then they actually sign agreements with this governing board. The governing board then actually oversight this so-called executive group, implementation people. So this is a board, this is implementation board. In essence, actually, we created a, 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 a another layer. That's a, that's a way to do it. You create a, a layer in between these two people, and then this uh, executive group comprises uh, the, the different uh, uh, so-called stakeholders, uh, representatives, deans, hospital CEO, and a hospital chairman and medical board, so forth. So the deans, obviously, the three schools I mentioned, and then you have the three uh, centers and so forth. So I think then with that, the governance is then unified. So that was uh, step number one they did. And then each of this is given so-called KPIs to deliver. And these people will then actually uh, pay according to how much uh, the deliverers are actually achieved over a certain time. So the second thing, uh, can we invite? Okay, second thing we did is obviously, I think the clinical departments at that time, there are too many of those departments. They are formed by evolution, by historical reasons. There are uh, all these smaller departments, also bigger departments, and the university departments are not exactly synced with the clinical departments. So that's what we have to actually start to reorganize this. So the, our chairman at the time, who happens also to be the president of NUS, did something very clever. He also clustered people together, meaning that all the medicine thing, they form a university medicine cluster just group them together. But he did it very well. He did over one hour. He grouped them together, saying that this is already done. Just take it or leave it. And then so, one by one, cluster them together. So each has a boss. You, st you can still be your own chief in your own department, but you have to have the thing. So I think all these cluster chairs then have to undertake certain things which the, the clinical heads cannot do, which is academia. Okay, so the cluster chair have a separate role compared with the clinical heads, but the cluster chair controls certain very important power. You have the resource, which the clinical heads do not have. And you have, you have to unify the teaching, you have to unify the research, and you, you're given all the power to hire people accordingly. Okay, so HR is very important. So at that time, this is done, and then also they put the administrators 
reporting directly to the cluster chair. So you got the administrative support directly under your charge at that time. So I think with that, uh, this uh, reorganization at the departmental level, the next thing we have to sort out is the people on the ground. So that's very important because I think you unify the top people, the leadership, you unify the middle ground, then the next thing is to try to then motivate the people on the ground. And the, bet the most powerful motivation is recognition system. Then, then you have to say, okay, what, how do you actually recognize the clinician's name? So this way we came up, we borrowed the American system, which is called the track system. So then there we, we realized that we need everyone. We need all the different types of soldiers on the ground. Some are better in clinical, some in teaching, some in research, and some in administration. So then you say that, okay, we need all, all, all these people. Then the cluster chairs will have to decide. Within this cluster, how many people do you need in each basket? Okay, so you need clinical, you may need the 60, percent clinical teaching, you need 20 percent and so forth. So then they, they, they decide accordingly. So they did a manpower rationalization uh, 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 exercise. So with that, we follow this thing. So I think you have uh, those people who are just interested in seeing patients, very good in seeing patients. You need a lot of these people. Okay, then they become, they are, they are, the percent of clinical is up to 95 percent. They do a bit of teaching and so forth. Then the clinician educator, 20% teaching, scholar 40%, and the scientists do mostly, I think, uh, uh, research, academia, and so forth. So I think you try to actually decide based on each person's strengths and so forth. And then after that, you recognize accordingly. So nobody is disadvantaged. So when it comes to exercise, you don't need to be good in all the four baskets. So you don't need to be good in all the four baskets. You just need to choose which one you want to score. And can you, you can still get maximum bonus. Okay? So the important thing is you need actually uh, exceptional people. You don't need average people. So that was done at that time. And uh, indeed, I just want to show you what happened. So I think we then track what's happening after all these changes were instituted. By tracking, we look at short-term gains. Say, for instance, I choose the cluster I was managing as the chair of the UNC medicine cluster. So after the reorganization, we realized that, so because we are given specific KPIs, and then you tell the clinician do something about the waiting time, sure, it actually waiting time went down after that. So I think we, then it's very specific because they know exactly what they're supposed to deliver, and then teaching feedback score also went up at that time, and then the research, uh, sorry, this uh, medical officer training uh, we also became very popular versus the other hospitals which were not academic health system. And then finally, I think the grants and so forth, so we were starting to win grants because we are using people effectively, not asking them to do everything, but asking them to focus on their, what they are doing best. So with that system, I think obviously, I think uh, also at the same time, I think obviously I think everyone knows about the red dot, Singapore is small. So you also know that what is the role of unity is to become <laughs> all these things, the world ranking, everyone knows about that. So I think uh, over the times, the, the, the School of Medicine in NUS and all the scores, we taught Asia. Okay? So I think there was a powerful incentive for people to want to become as a very top academic health system. So, so you are benchmarked globally and you cannot actually escape that. So I think that was okay at that time, about 10 years ago, and so leading to this. So in some ways, we thought we were successful, okay? Then there's a second part of the story, okay? So, so far, so good. But then, 10 years on, now this is 10 years later, 208 reform it, this is 2017, time flies. So 10 years on, so what's actually happening to Singapore? So obviously, a lot happened in Singapore. The, our aging population started Okay, we know that Singapore now, in fact, is going to surpass Japan as the fastest growing aging population in the world. So this is actually something which has come to Singapore. So with that, obviously, I think you all have all the problems of aging population, uh, uh, people living longer, the burden of chronic disease goes up, and not enough healthcare workers because Singapore population cannot grow. 
not, not enough children. So the ratio actually is swinging. And you cannot have too many immigrants. People are not happy. So you're stuck now. You have to find new solutions. So that's where the government tries to come up with what we call fundamental solutions for tomorrow. So firstly, they have to reorganize now the healthcare system. They know that if, if the current healthcare system is based on hospitals, you will go broke in no time because the older people uh, require a lot of resources. So now they have to reorganize the healthcare system, which is what they did. So now they from the two clusters, they form into six clusters. And now they ask the hospitals to look after each of this region, including community care. It's under your, your, it's under your problem now. So you form, so each of the hospitals, including us, we look after this area and Jurong here and so forth. I think you, some of you know the different places. So now, now there are about six now, six regional healthcare system. So now from the AMS, AHS, you're already so busy now, they tell you, oh, look after more people. Know how, how you're going to cope. Okay, so this is one thing. So the second thing is we need to try to transform the models of care. You can't do the same all the time. So this way, how do you actually transform it? So we believe that technology is one of the ways to go. I think the whole world is using technology, so you want to save manpower, you've got to use technology. So this way, I think the shift now in the mindset is important because of that reasons. And uh, concurrently also, the Singapore governments also realize that translating alone is not enough. You've got to create values now. I'll come to that later on. Meaning that the values now, you have to start to say that, how do you actually work together now with industry for greater impact? Translating could be translate anything, but no use to you. You've got to actually scale up so that people in the streets, people in the population, people in the industry can benefit from research. Okay? So I think we, all, we learn from over the time what is research, you've got to actually evolve. Otherwise, you will not actually close the loop. It has to close the loop until you get impact. And this is actually fundamentally something that I am quite passionate about because otherwise you live to no end. What is exactly is research? It must benefit mankind. So that's where we are very bad in doing that. We are still no good. So, so I think uh, then we change the way we look at research now. Okay? So research, on one hand, not just doing research, we have to be international competitive. So the research has to be top, has to be globally uh, uh, good. And second thing is, uh, so research is about discovery, by the way. Okay? To me, it's re repeated search until you discover something. That's what it means. And whilst I think uh, something else must uh, be included under research, which is called in innovation and enterprise. So what it means is innovation is finding new solutions. So if you search for something, discover something, but you don't have solution from the discovery, it's also no, no point. So you need to have innovation and finding enterprise is about adoption, practice, skill up, and so forth. So you need those people. So that's where it will lead on to the health and economic impact. So now we are actually heading towards this. Best, I think we are trying to hit this one. So some, some research may be very good in terms of academia, but not no impact in terms of here. Some have a lot of impact here, but very little publication. So best, we have to do both, okay? That's where it comes to the, 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 the next things about Singapore, why this, this is important now. Because the government also look at the whole island Okay, they realized that over the time, this is an economic curve. Okay, so they grew from labor intensive to skills intensive, capital intensive, technology intensive. Then they realized that there's a problem. If you continue this way, you, you can't actually be competitive. So the next thing they were now trying to tell us is, I think the world is changing to knowledge intensive, so you must be knowledge intensive, which they already did. So they say that's not, also not enough. The next big thing is actually, called innovation intensive, because the world is going to innovation. Even if you have knowledge, everybody else also has knowledge. So how do you get an edge uh, faster than the rest? You've got to actually come up with a new solution. This is why people like Steve Jobs and all these people are, 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 are doing so well, because they are very fast in coming up with new solutions, and people love new solutions nowadays. So that's where innovation uh, intensive is important. But I think uh, finally, I think to keep going, uh, remain relevant, you got to actually marry all everything together. That's where they started this RIE. Research, innovation, enterprise all have to be combined. 
So that's way I think uh, we have to start to rethink as an academic health system. What is then our role? What is then our relevance when this, this, the whole world is changing now into this RE uh, phase? And uh, so I think the, the, the cat, then we say we cannot be a copycat. So we have to be also innovative, come up with a new solution. Simply doing research not enough. So our deputy prime minister say commercialization, we have to start to actually move from upstream to downstream, which means discovery all the way to the last person on the ground must benefit from research, innovation, and enterprise. So then, that's what, what is going to happen. Okay, we started off with 333. Three, three. three centers, three schools, and three pillars. So recently, in the last one year, we think that we have to have two more poles, two more pillars now. So I think we also form five centers now, okay? The dental start to come up and the regional healthcare system, which I mentioned, we have to look after the region now. So five centers, three, remains three schools, and then we have two extra pillars. These two pillars are innovation and population, so that we can do the enterprise part. We can scale up our research effort and we can also come up with new solutions. It's not just a search, okay? So one, way of, one quick way of understanding what is research and innovation is I'll give you the example about the world, okay? Research is like discovering a new continent, okay? People who actually take the boat on the old days and come to Indonesia and discover, oh, there's this island called Indonesia. So they've done the job, which is called research. Things are already there, but you search and then you find it. That's what research is. But innovation is, nothing will happen still if you search a new continent, if you don't do anything about the continent. So then the innovation part is you settle down in this country and then you develop it so that people benefit. Otherwise, that's nothing. So that's where innovation comes and enterprise comes. Okay? So that's my understanding on now what research innovation. Okay? So you need everyone. You need the discovery to, to find it. You need people who develop and then you need people who scale it up. So it is very important. So because of that reason, we realize that uh, uh, we, we have to start to rebuild our, our uh, uh, region. So we started forming what we call the entire cluster around NUH. We also, we just been given a land here, very close to the hospital, to actually develop it as an innovation center and looking after all the different things. Now, that's an academic program now in the Alexandra campus. Okay, that's given to us now to develop it. So now we look at research, innovation, enterprise as an entire end-to-end -end program. So from healthy before they are sick to, to, to when you need to do prevention and treatment and all the way to end of life and so forth. So to the entire continuum, we need to look at the entire thing now, not just in terms of here, which is we are very, very good. So everything now, because that's what people want us to do as academic health care system, not an academic medical center. So I think now the mindset has changed because of the aging population. Then the research and innovation also, we realized that in 2008, we were using the simplistic term, research only. So we were very good in research. You can buy people to do research. You can buy world-class people, but you cannot buy the next two people because they have to be local. Okay, similar to Explorer, you can buy Explorer and then send them to search for certain things. But you cannot, cannot buy people to settle in a place and then develop it. That's harder. So that's where, in terms of recognition of the people, now we start to, to look at it. In terms of researchers, innovators, and scalers. So they have to be, they are different. Okay, so that's the next uh, big uh, area we have to develop now, which is, uh, so researcher, what do they need to do? We have to organize them into clusters. Okay, so basics department cannot be separate silos. They have to group together. And, uh, and then departments into programs. Because I think uh, there's still a, very, a strong tendency for people to just work on their own because you recognize them separately. You recognize them for publication, grants, they don't want to work together. So the future is definitely working together. Otherwise, you can't scale. Okay, so the innovators and the scaler, you've got to recognize them. Those people are different. You can't just recognize them in terms of publications and grants. You miss them all. They will, nobody wants to be innovators because you don't recognize them. So what for? 
So that's where we have to start to come up with ways to recognize these people in order for us to be complete, to be a relevant academic health system. So finally, I think uh, this is the last slide. So finally, I think uh, we learn through this journey, more than 10 years journey, about what's happening. I think now we realize that we have to constantly change to remain relevant. Okay, times has changed and the world has changed. So we think that now the change, what is the change which is necessary? I think uh, collaboration is very important. Collaboration because we don't know a about everything. In order to have an impact, we need to collaborate for impact. And that impact is beyond papers, beyond grants. It has to be relevant now, okay? To, to the human, to mankind, because we look at it, 100 years ago, no research. If you look at medicine practice 100 years ago, it's really bad. And now you say that everything is so advanced. It all, be of all because of research. 10 years ago, different. And 10 years later, things. Now we are actually reaching more and more complex things. We need to work together in order to keep solving more and more things. So, so that's where impact is beyond uh, academic excellence. It has to be relevant. If th those people never do anything, IT world is already moving very fast because they collaborate, they keep solving problems very quickly. We have to continue to do that. So the recognition system obviously must reflect this change. So I think the last uh, thing is, this is our president's, uh, uh, I quote from our president of NUS, who say that competition is a driver, certainly because the competition with the rest of the world, it drives us to look at changing, drives us to do, look at new solutions and so forth. But collaboration is certainly a strategy. That's why we like to work with UGM. And I think you also came down uh, a year ago to want to work together. Only by working together, we actually can do better things. So with that, thank you very much for your attention. Thank you very much, Professor Lawrence, for your very attractive uh, lecture. And uh, please. See.